Father in heaven, again, we thank you. We thank you, dear God, for your kindness, for your love for us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the truth of thy word. We pray that it would be a light unto our feet, that it would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway, and truly that we would know from experience the promise that says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. And so we pray that our simple minds, we could understand such sacred and heavenly truth. But we need the anointing of thy Holy Spirit. Please teach us. We pray that you would mute the distractions in our homes, that you would be with our uh, internet services as these things are communicated. But we pray that our connection with heaven would be stronger, that we lose not our connection with thee. Cleanse us, we pray, of sin. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, when we look at the book, of Daniel. I would like for us to turn in our Bibles to our opening passage, which is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Ah, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is where we will begin our study of the great apostasy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we're going to look at verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Heavenly Father, we open thy word and again we pray for wisdom, we pray for understanding that you would quicken us in Christ's name. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, here we find Paul after labored much among the Gentiles, as he, again, studies the Word of God. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said that if, when this gospel is preached into all the world, then shall the end come. Paul was able to say that every creature under heaven has heard the gospel. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that Paul, he spent two years in Asia, and it says that everyone heard the gospel. Jesus says, when this gospel is preached unto all the world for a witness, when it is demonstrated in its, in its power in the lives of those who present it, then Christ will come. Not simply the reiteration of, of, of gospel passages, not simply the reiteration of sermons and, 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 and doctrines and, and uh, lines of theology, but when the gospel is demonstrated in the life, Christ says he will come. Paul says in Romans 1, 16, verse 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For, for it is the power of God unto salvation, unto everyone that believeth. Verse 17 says, for therein the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So when the characteristics of the gospel is exemplified in our life when it bears witness to the world that we are the sons of God. When the world sees this, that is uh, uh, saying and showing that the character of Christ through the gospel is being reproduced in his church. This is when Jesus 
will come. So as Paul, bearing about in his body the dying of the Lord Jesus, Paul who said, I die daily, Paul who said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life he is living in the flesh, he lives by the faith of the Son of God. Paul could say that I have finished my course. Paul could say that he has kept the faith. Paul could say that henceforth there is laid up for him a crown of righteousness. Paul was able to declare and show that Christ was lived out in his life. And yet Paul, as he saw what was happening in the church, even in his time, Paul wrote these words to the Thessalonians, but not so much for them because they would not see the development of the man of sin. They saw the various um, principles that would bring about this, this great apostasy. He saw that this compromise with the world would bring about such an event that the church would lament. And he writes here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1. And notice what Paul says. Paul says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the, that the day of Christ is at hand. So here Paul is telling the church, and he says in verse two again, that ye be not shaken in your mind, that you understand that you, as Peter said, have not followed cunningly devised fables when they made known unto you the coming and the majesty of Jesus. Paul says, Peter says they were eyewitnesses in second Peter chapter one. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He says, but you have a more sure word of prophecy that you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. He says, understand this, that, that, that prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God would speak as they were and will be moved by the Holy Ghost. No prophecy of the scripture, he goes on to say, is of any private interpretation. Paul had warned Timothy that there would be some who would teach that Jesus is come already. He says, for this reason, Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but what? Rightly dividing the words of truth. He says, because there are some who are teaching that Christ has come. And he says, they overthrow the faith of some. But nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So these emphatic words we find from the apostles concerning those who were teaching things that was not according to what God had spoken by the prophets before. Paul said in Galatians chapter one, that if anybody preaches any other gospel than that which has been preached, it says, let him be accursed. And so Paul is warning the church in Thessalonians, Paul is warning the church today that you be not shaken by words, by any spirit. Don't be shaken because this is what the enemy is trying to do. He's trying to move us from the foundation of God. By what? Words. By what? Letters. By sermons. By, by, by books. By various means. By, by false spirits. 
He is trying to move us from our foundation. And if we would, and if we would stand firm and not be shaken in our minds, we must study the Word of God. We must conform to the truth that God has given to us in His Word. It's not about theology, brothers and sisters. The reiteration of doctrines will never bring us to a point of truly trusting in Jesus. We have to come to the point like the woman who had the issue with blood, physical, literal disease. But the blood is a symbol of the life in those who have an issue and those who are struggling with issues in their life. They must realize that they must take hold of God's garment. Garments in the Bible are synonymous with character. We must partake and take hold of the character. We must study the life of Jesus. If we would overcome these issues in our life, we must take hold of his word and by faith, we must walk in the promises and we must resolve to be like Jesus in every situation we find ourselves in. And so this is why Paul says, don't be shaken. And this is why the Bible said, matter of fact, oh, we, 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 we'll come back here, but go to Proverbs. Go to Proverbs. Uh, let's see. Go to Proverbs chapter 1. Go to Proverbs <clears throat> chapter, hmm, is it Proverbs 1? Oh, come on. Um, hmm, it's Proverbs chapter 1. Mm, mm, mm. Let's see, Proverbs. Uh, mm. Mm. I'm thinking Proverbs 1, but I wonder could it be Proverbs... I don't think it's nine, but I'm looking for the passage where it says, cease my son from the instructions that causes thee to err. Cease from the instruction that causes thee to err. All right. You looking that up for me, Tim? Cease from the instruction that causes thee to to air. He'll get that for us in a moment. You probably already know where it is and you're probably screaming at the computer, but I can't hear you. Amen. So here Paul tells us that he says he beseeches the church. He's pleading with us. <clears throat> Don't be shaken in your mind. By word, by letters, <clears throat> He says, verse, verse 2 again, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, either by sermons, by written literature, uh, uh, by the influence of, the, of these false spirits. It says, don't be shaken. These are things by which Satan will seek to shake us from a sure foundation. It says, it's in Proverbs where it says, cease my son from the instruction that causes thee to err. If you just type in cease, C-E-A-S-E. -E. Ah, no, no, I can't pull that. Why this? Scripture won't come to mind. But notice what it says. Second Thessalonians. If he give it to us, I'll call it out. Notice what it says. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let's look at verse two again. He says that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Verse three. Let no man what deceive you by any means for that day. 
mercy. I was off by 19 chapters. Proverbs 19, 27. Amen. So write down Proverbs 19, 27, next to verse 2 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Write down Proverbs 19, 27, where Solomon says, cease my son from the instructions that will cause thee to err, that will cause thee to move in the direction that is not in harmony with the truth of God's word. But he says in Proverbs 3, bind the law about thy neck. <clears throat> David says, thy word is a lamp and a light. So cease from the instructions that's causing thee to go contrary to truth. Cease to listen. Cease to read. Cease to be in the environment that will cause you to move in a direction that places you out of harmony with God. And there are churches where you will have to forego your attendance because the instruction is causing you to move in error. There were people, I was at someone's home the other day and they said, you know, this, and they began to name these individuals and they said, you know what? I can't even listen to these individuals. One thinks he's a prophet. You may already know who I'm talking about, but one thinks he's a prophet. And one is just constantly uh, uh, badgering and looking for something uh, 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 to, to say. And I said, I can't listen anymore. And this is what we have to do, brothers and sisters. We will have to study the word of God and we will have to allow the word of God to give us light and understanding and that will guide us and lead us into truth. But he says in verse three, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, for that day shall not come except there come a what? Falling away. That word, that falling away is where we get the word apostasy. This is where we get the word apostasy. And so God says there, there, there will come a falling away first. And this, notice, notice what it says, except there come a falling away first and the one, the man of sin, the lawless one be revealed. The son of of destruction. So the Bible says, it says, don't be shaken by those who are bringing you false words, false letters, who are trying to inspire you with a false spirit. Don't be moved by that. It says, <clears throat> And why not be moved? Because we must study 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 down to verse 19. We have to study. John says that if they bring not this doctrine, he said, don't even let them in your home. Don't let them, don't let them in there. And, 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 and in a broader sense, they shouldn't be allowed to preach in the churches. But they are. But, 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 but we should not allow them in our homes. How? Don't allow them in your, on your screen. Don't allow them to, to come through the airwaves and come into your home via Facebook, via YouTube, via Twitter, via whatever. Don't allow these individuals who are bringing teachings that are not in harmony with the word of God. Don't allow them in your home. Why? Because like Eve, if you sit and listen to the serpent long enough, you will begin to see the things the way they see it. And so Paul says, but he says, but know this, that there has to come a falling and apostasy first. And the man of sin, the lawless one that will seek to exalt traditions, he will seek to exalt man-made ideas above the word of God. Similar, similar to what we saw in Christ's time. In the book of Matthew chapter 15, we'll come back here, but notice what it says in Matthew, the 15th chapter, similar to what we saw in Christ's time. Notice what it says in Matthew, the 15th chapter. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Look what it says in verse 1 
of Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 down to verse 3. God says there will come an apostasy. First, the man of sin, the lawless one, who will, who will say he's teaching the word of God, but, it, but in truth he's teaching traditions. Yes, Leah. Matthew, what? Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. She was raising her hand. Amen. Matthew the 15th chapter. This lawless one. They will teach what will seem like the word of God. It will seem as though they, at, they are adhering to various principles of truth. But in reality, they are usurping the word of God for their own traditions. Notice what it says. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, down to verse 3, the Bible says, Then came to Jesus scribes, Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why, why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? Now notice, brothers and sisters, they use that word transgression in the same context that God uses it in, 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 uh, in making reference to breaking his laws. We read in the book of Daniel where Daniel says, we transgress thy commandments. We transgress thy statutes. But here these men, these religious leaders, they come to Jesus and they say to him, why do you violate the laws and the statutes that the church has established. In other words, what we say is just as sacred as God's law. As a matter of fact, you will be condemned more for violating us than you will for violating the law of God. Christ says in another place that, 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 that uh, uh, you have taught people where God says we are to honor thy mother and father. You have taught them that if they do this, they don't have to obey the law of God. They have to obey your word. If they, if they would pronounce something over their, their, uh, uh, their property, they don't have to give it to their parents. They could be in the dispute and they, and they don't want to give anything to their parents. So they could be in dispute and they could take it away and give it to the church. And Christ says you suffer them to do nothing for their parents and they're transgressing the law of God to stay in harmony with the church. And this is what they came to Jesus with. They said, why do you transgress the church's rules. We voted this. We put this in place. It's here. Look at it. It's here in our manual. This is something that everyone has to abide by. Why are you violating the church's traditions? Notice what Christ says. Christ said, they said in verse two, why do you transgress the tradition of the elders? They wash not their hands when they eat bread. Verse 3, but he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? He says, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that cursed father and mother let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever the church might be profited. <clears throat> uh, 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 by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. And he says, as Isaiah says, you honor, you honor, you come before God and you honor him with your mouth. When your hearts, it says, when your hearts are far from him. This is what they were doing in Christ's time. This was an apostasy. It was man's traditions that was set up in the place of God's law. They were thinking to change God's law, but Christ said, no, God's law hasn't changed and the church coming together in session does not, does not lessen the claims of God's law. 
And there's nothing, brothers and sisters, that we can do to strengthen what God has already said. The Bible says the way is straight and the, and the, 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 the way is narrow and the gate is straight. We cannot make it any more narrow by our traditions. But what's happening is, brothers and sisters, we're just trying to broaden that road a little bit. But we're not broadening the road. We're actually leading people to the broad road where at the end thereof, there is destruction or perdition. So Jesus, so Paul says that let no man there deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice, brothers and sisters, there's another gentleman who has similar characteristics of this perditious one. Notice what the Bible says in the book of John, chapter 17. John, chapter 17. There was a gentleman, a man by the name of Judas, a man by the name of Judas, who is called the son of perdition. He's the son of perdition. What did he do? He sold the truth for his own profit. He sought to bring the world and the church together. But in doing so, Jesus would have to be killed. And it was all for profit. It was all for financial gain. And notice what Christ, how Jesus refers, Leah, to Judas. Notice what it says in verse, in verse hmm, 11 and verse 12. Notice what it says. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, one as one. We are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those, those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none, and none, and none of them is lost. But the what? The son of perdition, Judas. None is lost but the son of perdition. Yes, Lee. I'm reading in Matt John 17, verse 11 and verse 12. You have it? All right. So the Bible tells us that none is lost but the son of perdition. Hold it. Notice what your Bible tells you in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. None is lost but the son of perdition. Who was that son of perdition? It was Judas. Who was the man of sin? The Bible tells us that he is in a lost condition. For what? Because he rejects the truth, that system of apostasy, God says, is in a lost condition. Thus, God would have his people to seek the lost, to bring them to his fold. There are those who are a part of this fallen system. It is fallen, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, remember, it says, except there come a what? Falling away. This fallen system, God says it is a system of destruction because of their rejection of truth. And God would have us to seek and save the lost, to bring them to his fold where they can find shelter, where they can be saved and be not partakers of their sins. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible says this, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. 
Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians and let's find and identify and begin to search out this, in this, this, this man of sin, this self-styled uh, 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 apostasy against truth. This man of sin who has styled himself as the one who leads people into lawlessness, into the rejection of truth. It goes on to say, except that, that it says, Christ shall not come, for that day shall not come, the coming of Christ, except there be an apostasy and a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 4, the Bible says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So in other words, what we are looking at is a substitute. To Christ. We are looking at a substitute, anti-Christ. It is against God, but it sits in the place. It is a substitute. So when we look at this anti-Christ power, it is showing us that it is a substitute to Christ. It will sit in the seat of God it will show himself that he is God. And the Bible calls this blasphemy. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But this power is a power that sits in the seat of God and it shows himself that he is God. Notice what it says. Verse 4 again. It says, Who opposeth? and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God, he will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then it says, verse 6, well, verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8, and then, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the what? The love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God will sin, God will allow strong delusions to come, that he should believe that they, that they who rejected the truth should believe a lie that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. This is the workings of the man of sin. This is that antichrist, that substitute power. It will not receive the love of the truth. It will not receive the love of the truth. It rejects Christ. And the Bible tells us that this power will be reigning upon the earth when Jesus comes. It says this wicked shall be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. This substitute antichrist power that styles itself as the man of sin. God calls it the man of sin but they implement their traditions in the place of God. 
Now let's go back in our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Let's go back in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, and we're going to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel the 7th chapter, and notice what the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel chapter 7. Now again, this is review. You looked at this. We studied this. So this should not be hard, and it, it will be easy to catch. But you, if you haven't been with us, then you can go back and look at our message on the empires of prophecy. But I pray that God will give you understanding even now. Let's look here in the book of Daniel chapter 7. And I want us to look at verse 7 and verse 8. We're only going to look at this fourth beast as, a, as its relation to the little horn. Now notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says this, And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and it break in pieces, and it stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten what? Horns. Let's stop right there. Jump over. Jump over in your Bibles and notice what it says in verse 19. Verse 19. Well, start in verse 17. Verse 17. The Bible says, These great beasts which are four, are four kings or four kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the one, the fourth beast, which was diverse or different from all others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And out of the ten horns of his, and pardon me, and of the ten horns which were in his head. Let's stop right there. If you go to your screen, we see this fourth beast. It's a description. This fourth beast um, had ten horns in its head. Now, if you remember, we identified these, this beast, right? We said that this beast would have ten horns, and these ten horns represented these various barbaric tribes that came up in the region of this fourth beast. We said this fourth beast lost its power in 476 AD. Hold your finger there and go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 12. If you have a marker, keep it in Daniel chapter 7. Just reviewing a bit, just reviewing a bit. You're going to Revelation, you're going to the 12th chapter, and you're looking at verse 1. Who did we identify that this fourth beast was? Who was this fourth beast? Let's see. You're in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And then it says, verse two, she and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having what? Seven heads and what? Ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Again, we saw and we said that this beast, follow me now, that this beast that had this seven heads, but 10 horns. And we were able to make the connection with Daniel seven and revelation chapter 12. It's the same beast. You said, but Daniel didn't say there were seven heads. Daniel didn't mention anything about crowns. No, he did not. But God has given a greater description of this power and what this would 
uh, uh, evolve into as we go through the book of Revelation. But it's the same power. Fourth beast. Remember, the first beast we saw in Daniel 7 was Babylon. The second beast we saw was Medes and Persians. The third beast we saw was Greece. And history tells us the fourth beast is, we'll see. We'll see if scripture tells us. Now notice, this, this beast here, he also has ten horns. Now watch what it says. He also has ten horns. And then the Bible tells us here that this dragon stood before, this dragon stood before, oh, in verse 4, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and our child was caught up unto God and to his throne. What? Who was this man child? Well, we have a description here. He was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And we read in our Bibles in Psalms 2, we're not going to go there, but Psalms 2, verse 7 to 9, where God speaks concerning this day have I begotten thee. He says, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen, that thou shalt rule them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt break or dash them to pieces. And then we saw in Acts chapter 13, Acts the 13th chapter, verse 30 to 33, that Jesus was this child. He was this one that Christ says, today have I begotten thee, not at birth, but in his resurrection. Jesus is this man child. So now, who is the woman? Well, the Bible tells us when we look at women and prophecy, she is likened unto a church. Ephesians 5, 25 down to 32. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Jeremiah 6 and verse 2. Isaiah 51 verse 16. God likens the woman to a church. And so we find that the woman who was bringing forth Christ was the church. What nation tried to devour Christ? Not only at his birth, but tried to devour and throw him in the grave and put a seal upon it and keep him out of sight so that he would see corruption and so that no one would ever know about him again. It was Rome. It was Rome that tried to do this. It tells us in John chapter 11, the Pharisees, when they were consulting of what they would do to Jesus, they said it was needful for him to die because if we don't put him to death, the what? Romans will come and take away our city and our nation. It was Rome that was ruling during the time of Jesus. It was Rome that was that Satan used to try to kill Jesus. It tells us in verse 9 that that great red dragon, it was the devil and Satan. That same power that calls war in heaven is the same power that moved upon, upon the uh, Pilate and, 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 and Caiaphas and Herod. It was the same ones that condemned Jesus. The same power that warred against Christ in heaven is the same power that has been warring against God since the beginning of time. It was Satan that worked through the powers of Rome. So the fourth beast was Rome. So in 476, when Western Rome came to its end because of the, uh, the, 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 the overrunning of the barbaric tribes that dismantled Western Rome among themselves, when Constantine moved the seat from Imperial Rome down to Turkey, Constantinople, that area was left vacant. And then the, the various hordes, the various 
barbaric tribes came down and they began to carve up Western Rome for themselves. And this is where they were until something would happen. Go back in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter seven. Go back in your Bibles to Daniel chapter seven. And let's now look at verse eight. Daniel chapter seven. And let's look at verse eight. Daniel seven, verse eight, the Bible says, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, so Daniel is shown this, but then all of a sudden Daniel is shown the judgment. And then I want us to notice what it says in verse 11. I beheld, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words, which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given and given to the what? Burning flames. Isn't that what Paul says? Paul says that this power would be consumed with the brightness of his coming. This is what God, this is what Paul says. Paul was studying the book of Daniel. And this is how God led him to the conclusion that the man of sin is the same power of Daniel chapter seven. He saw that this power is going to come up from among Rome. It would develop right there in Europe. The man of sin power would develop right there in Europe. Notice what it says now. Paul is, Daniel is seeing this, but I want you to notice. Daniel said, I want to know the truth of this fourth beast. I got the first three. I got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, but something about this fourth beast. And we discovered the fourth beast was Rome. But he said, out of that fourth beast would come 10 horns. And then out of those 10 horns, notice what your screen says. There would come, notice what your screen shows. There would come up another little horn. He would have eyes like the eyes of a man and he would have a mouth speaking great words. And then, Jan, uh, excuse me, then John Daniel saw that this beast as a result of the judgment would be given to the burning flames. When? When Christ comes. And so Daniel says, I want to know the truth of this fourth beast. Notice the explanation he is given in verse 19. Come back with me to verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Verse 20, we read verse 19, verse 20. And out of the horns and of the horns, pardon me, and of the 10 horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld in the same war, same horn made war, made war with the saints and prevailed against them until what the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints. Look at verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom of the earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms that were before it and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the 10 horns out of his kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. And notice now, and another shall arise after them. And he, this one that comes up after the 10, shall be different even from those and shall subdue three of these kings. Now I want us to notice, let's go to our screen. I want us to notice here is that it says three of these horns were to be plucked up by the roots. 
three of these horns were to be plucked up by the roots. Because notice, as long as these ten horns are there, this little horn will not have, cannot have the supremacy that it needs. Those, those who would oppose its rise must be moved out of the way. Now notice, brothers and sisters, I want you to notice your screen here. King Clovis of France. Notice this. This is a mural that you see on your right there. It is a, it is a depiction of King Clovis being baptized. Not really baptized, I would say, more like sprinkled with, with, with what they would call holy water. Sprinkled. Why? Clovis is important in the uh, historiography of France as the first king that would become, pardon me, the first king of what would become France. Clovis is also significant due to his what? Conversion to Catholicism in 496. Largely at the behest of his wife, um, Clotaud, Clotadi, who would later be venerated as a saint for this act, celebrated today in both the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox Church, Clovis was baptized on Christmas Day in 508. The adoption, the adoption by Clovis of Catholicism as opposed to the Arianism of most other dramatic tribes, that's speaking about those ten horns, led to widespread conversion among the Frankish people to religious unification across what is now modern day France. So in other words, Clovis used his military power, used his influence to cause a conversion, to cause a conformity to Catholicism views, Catholic views over their Aryan views and those who rejected this new form of idolatry, if you will, they were uprooted. They were moved out of the way. It goes on to say, Belgium and Germany, three centuries later, to Charlemagne's alliance with the Bishop of Rome, and in the middle of the 10th century under Otto, Otto I the Great, it says, to the consequent birth, notice, to the consequent birth of the early Holy Roman Empire, the papacy. This is what brought about moving pagan Rome to papal Rome. This is what brought the Pantheon to the Vatican. We'll go on. <clears throat> I want us to notice now as we look at this little horn, go back in your Bible to the book of Daniel, go back to Daniel chapter seven, go back to Daniel chapter seven. So these three horns were uprooted. They were not uprooted by the literal little horn, but a power was used to move them out of the way. France, King Clovis became an instrument for the little horn to move out those who opposed the new religion that brought paganism and apostate Christianity together. Now Clovis did not bring about this conversion of paganism to Christianity. This had begun under Constantine the Great. When Constantine had his nominal conversion, when Constantine believed that he had a vision and he saw the sign of a cross and, and, and then he had that cross put on all the battle shields, the breastplates of his soldiers. And after he won that battle, he came back and he, and he, been, came, and he began to conform to the Christian faith. And the church thought this was a, was a grand movement. This is taught in the book of Revelation under, 
under the time period of a church called Pergamos, which means union and marriage. And what does it use as an example? It uses Balaam and Balak. Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, that's Judas, went and got Balak. Judas went and got the Pharisees and brought them together for what? To destroy the truth. And so Judas, son of perdition, acted almost in his time to bring together apostate Christianity, which he was, and to bring uh, for the wages of unrighteousness, for money. And he brought the two together for the purpose of destroying the truth. Now notice, brothers and sisters, so Constantine, in the days of Constantine, Constantine had passed laws that made religious tolerable in society. And as religion became more tolerable, it began to adopt and embrace pagan ideas. It began to lower the standards. And as it lowered the standards, paganism began to move into the church. They began to take their statues, their statues of Hercules, their statues of Atlas, and they began to conform them and say, no, it's not Hercules anymore, it's Jesus. It's not Atlas anymore, it's God the Father. It's not the Queen of Heaven, uh, Samarimus, it's Mary. It's not all these, 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 these demigods, they're the disciples, they're the saints. So they're not, in it. they're not demigods anymore. They're the saints. They're here to help us. They're not the Batmans and the Superman. These are all, these are all pagan mythologies that have been converted into modern day saints to help society. They are there for the betterment of society. This is what Marvel Comics presents these heroes as. So as we teach our children to, 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 we sit our child before the Incredible Hulk and we sit our child before Spider-Man and we take him to see Superman and we take him to see uh, 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 Captain America and these Marvel comics. Brothers and sisters, these are nothing more than the pagan demigods who have been converted into modern day saints. And these figures are now embraced by the church. In this our day, <clears throat> Black Panther, we like to see some religious, yes, there is something religious there, but it's pagan, brothers and sisters. It's paganism that have been conformed into saints in this modern day era, but it's paganism, it's spirituality. It is the worship of demons, just as, as verily as they worship idols in the groves of ancient times. And so this is what we're seeing. This is what was happening during Constantine's time. But Constantine, while he brought together paganism and Christianity, this union, this marriage between the world and the church, but he did not give it its political power. He gave it religious power. But King Clovis comes along and gives it political power, gives it the right arm of the state. The sword was put into the hands of the church. And this is why many atheists today have bumper stickers and say that when the church ruled the world, it was called the Dark Ages. And that's true, brothers and sisters, it was the Dark Ages. It was the church. It was, it was the man of sin that ruled the world with an iron fist. That created the inquisition. That created the tortures. Notice what it says in the book of Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, the Bible says this power in verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High 
and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he will think to change times and laws, and they and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Now, brothers and sisters, that symbol of the hand is persecution. When you read, you can read in uh, Daniel chapter three, write it down. When the three word Hebrew boys were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar said at the sound of the music, you if, if you bow well, but if not, I'm going to cast you into the fire. And then he says these words. And who is that God that can deliver you out of my hand? It is a symbol of persecution. They were given into his hand for a time, times, and the dividing of times. Notice what your screen says. Time, times, and the dividing of times. A time is one year, 360 days. We'll see why in a minute. Times is two years. 720 days. And then we have a half a time or a half a year, which is 180 days. And this is where we get three and a half years or time or 1260 days or years. All right. So time times and the half of times is equal to 1200 and 60 years. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to hold your finger here. Now, notice what it says. They'll be given into his hands to a time, time, and a dividing of times. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Revelation 13. Revelation 13, we see this same power again. Now, brothers and sisters, it's very important for us to understand all these identifying marks. You say, well, when you look at Daniel 7, then you go to Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13, you see there are some similarities, but there are also some differences. And God is wanting us to understand no matter where this power tries to, uh, 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 no matter how this power tries to become a chameleon and, and merge itself somewhere else, God shows us every way in which it turns and transforms itself. So no matter where it hides, no matter what it stands next to, no matter what it uses for a camouflage, God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. God's word helps us to expose and identify the man of sin. So no matter where she shows her head, God says her head must be crushed like the serpent. He shows us no matter how she tries to conform to the environment around her and look harmless to, by blending in, God identifies her so that we will be able to see her craftiness. Notice what your Bible says in Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. Now watch this, brothers and sisters. Revelation 13. Let's start in verse 1. Revelation chapter 13. And we're looking at verse one. The Bible says, and I stood, John says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now we understood what the seas symbolize, right? Matter of fact, let's look at it. Revelation 17 and let's look at verse 15. Since we're here, Revelation chapter 17, let's start at verse one and then read verse 15. Revelation 17, verse one, the Bible says, and there was given and there came, there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows. And he talked with me saying unto me, come hither and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that what sitteth upon many waters. Verse 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are what peoples and what multitudes and nations and tongues just like we saw in the book of Daniel chapter seven, Daniel saw these beasts rise up out of the sea, one after the other. The fourth beast came up out of the sea. John sees this beast rise up out of the sea. Singular beast, but I watched the description that John gives. 
Now watch this, brothers and sisters. Oh, I wish I would have put this in the slide, but I don't have it. But notice the Bible says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. There those horns are again. And upon his horns, ten what? Crowns. And upon his heads, the name of what? Blasphemy. The name of blasphemy. We're going to come to that in a moment. Notice. Now, let me throw this point in. I didn't make a slide, but let's throw this point in. Daniel, as he's standing there and he sees these beasts coming up out of the kingdom, out of the sea. He sees the first beast lion was a lion, Babylon. Then he sees the next beast, Medo-Persia. Then he sees the next beast, Greece. Then he sees the next beast, Rome. Then he sees the ten horns. Then he sees the little horns. So Daniel <clears throat> is standing in the place of Babylon looking forward. John is going to give us a description from the place of Rome looking backwards. What do you, what do you got, Lee? Where are you reading? I'm reading in Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Now notice what he says here, brothers and sisters. Revelation 13. Look what he says in verse 2. <clears throat> John is looking from where he is backwards. Watch what he says. Revelation 13. It says in verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a what? Leopard. Who is the leopard? Greece. And had his feet as the feet of a bear. Who's the bear? Who's the bear? Medo-Persia. And he had the mouth of what? A lion. Who's the lion? Rome. Watch this. So John says, I see this beast and it's like Greece. It's like Medo-Persia. It's like Babylon. He says, but he notices that this beast gets its power from the dragon. Who is the dragon? Rome. Now, why does this composite, you can see it there on your screen. Why does this beast, this amalgamated composite beast, why does it get its power from Rome? Why does it get his power from the dragon, which is Rome? Watch, watch Revelation 13. Oh, brother says, I hope you get it. Notice what it says in, Reve in, in verse two again. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. He had his feet as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power. Notice and his seat and what great authority. The dragon, Rome, gave this power his seat and gave him authority. Authority, what did he do with this authority? What did this power do with this authority? We're going to see what it would do with this authority. Notice what it says in verse mm, 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Verse four. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to do what? Make war with him. This power sits in the seat of God. Hold your finger there and go to Exodus chapter 15. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to do what? Make war with him. Look in your Bibles in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 15. This is a song that we sing. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter 15. And let's look at verse 11 Exodus 15 verse 11 the Bible says who is like unto thee O Lord among the gods who is like unto thee glorious in holiness fearful and 
praises, doing wonders. Notice what it says in verse 3. The Lord is a what? Man of war. The Lord is his. Wait a minute. So when the Bible says in Revelation 13 that this power says, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him, this power styles itself as God on earth, who is like unto this beast, who is able to make war with her. Now we understand, now remember, all of these powers behind them was Satan. All of these powers Satan was trying to use to destroy the people of God, but God would often override their decisions for his own glory. So the dragon giving men his power, in one sense, yes, Satan is there, but in another sense, it is Rome. But who inspired Rome to give this power, to give this power his seat and great authority? Who led Rome? And specifically, it was Constantine. When Constantine moved the seat from Imperial Rome and he moved it down to Constantinople, he left his seat in Imperial Rome to the bishops. He left it for the church to rule at her dictates, but she didn't have any influence, any real power to implement her false traditions. She needed, she needed someone to ride. Just as when Caiaphas wanted to kill Jesus, it could not kill Jesus. It could not implement his laws. Pilate said, judge him according to your law. And they said, no, we, have our, uh, uh, we are forbidden to put any man to death. We need your signature. And Pilate gave his hand to crucify Jezebel, who wanted Naboth, when, when Ahab wanted Naboth's field. Jezebel wanted him dead, but Jezebel had no authority. What did she do? She put letters in the king's name, signed it with his ring, and the men carried out the brutal murder of Jezebel, but it was written down in history as Ahab. It would be seen in the records that Ahab ordered the death of Naboth and his family. But it wasn't Ahab, it was Jezebel. Just like in the days of John the Baptist. When John the Baptist told Herod that it wasn't, that, that it wasn't lawful for him to have his brother's wife. And Herodias, what did she do? She wanted to put John to death. She wanted John dead, but she couldn't do it. So what did she do? She brought in her daughter who seduced Herod. And it was Herod, and it was a suggestion of Herodias for the head of John the Baptist on the charger. But she couldn't do it. Herod had to do it. And this power could not bring war against the saints. It could not prevail against them until it got a power from the political side. It was a church that had a bark. It had a mouth and it spread great words against the Most High but it could do nothing against the saints without the political power of the nation. And Rome supplied this power with the sword. Just like we read with King Clovis, King Clovis began to war against the Aryan powers on behalf of Holy Roman Empire, the papacy which later fomented into what we know today as Roman Catholicism, which means universal church. So notice, brothers and sisters, but notice here you are in Revelation 13. Revelation 13, look what it says. Revelation 13, it says, Who is able to make war with him? Verse 5, And there, and there, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, <clears throat> and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and what? Two months. Notice what, I buy, notice what your screen says. Forty and two months. Forty-two months times thirty. Thirty days in a month. This is biblical time. So forty-two times thirty, you would get what? Twelve. Sixty. One month is thirty days. How do we see that? 
we see it from God's calendar. Notice what your Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. Let's just look at it, brothers and sisters. Genesis chapter 7. Notice what it says. Genesis 7. And you're looking at verse 11 as it relates to the ark that was being built in Noah's time. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis 7 verse 11. The Bible says in Genesis 7 verse 11, it says in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day the fountains, same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Verse 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth. How long? A hundred and what? Fifty days. Right? From what time? From the 600th year, from the second month, and the 17th day. Now go to chapter 8 and verse 3. So it was 150 days from the 600th year of Noah's life, from the second month and the 17th day of the month. You in Genesis chapter 8, verse 3, the Bible says the waters returned from off the earth continually and after, and after the end of the one, 150 days were the waters abated. Now watch this, verse 4. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Still the 600th year, but now in the seventh month, in the 17th day of the month. How many months are that in between? It's five. So if five months, 150 days, that is 30 day months. This is why, this is why we use the biblical time and this is how we can see the prophecy as it relates. So now, in Revelation 13, it tells us that this power, go back to Revelation 13, go back in your Bibles to Revelation 13, Revelation chapter 13, it says that this power in verse five, it was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So we see the 1260, the 42 months of Revelation 13 is equal to the time times and the dividing times of Daniel chapter seven. Right? So the time, times, and a half a times, 1260. The 42 months, 1260. Speak great things against the Most High. Now I want us to notice something because we, we keep seeing this term blasphemy. Go in your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 2. Go in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And notice what it says from verse 5 down to verse 7. Mark chapter 2, verse 5, down to verse 7. And I want you to see something. Mark chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. The Bible says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain other scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak what? blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but what? God only. Go in your Bibles to John chapter 10. John the 10th chapter. John chapter 10. And notice what the Bible says in verse 30 to 33. John chapter 10. Blasphemy, brothers and sisters. He would have a great, he would have a mouth speaking great words, speaking blasphemy. He would, Paul says, he would sit in the seat of God showing himself that he is God, anti, meaning substitute. He would be in the place of God to the people. Notice what it says. John chapter 10, verse 30 to 33. It says, I and my father, Christ says, are one. Then the Jews took up stones to sown him. And Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed thee from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not. But for what? Blasphemy. And because that thou being a 
man maketh thyself God. Maketh thyself God. Let me show you another passage. Go to Psalms. Psalms, I believe we want the 80th division of Psalms. Psalms 80. And notice what the Bible tells us here in the 80th division of Psalms. Psalms 80, verse 1. Psalms 80, verse 1. The Bible says in Psalms 80, verse 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that what? Dwellest between the what? The cherubims shine forth. Most holy place, Jesus sits, as it were, on a throne, and there are angels in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary. The Shekinah glory would rest upon the mercy seat. There will be two angels with their faces reverently facing the law of God, showing that the mystery of God, the mystery of salvation, that God can be just and yet can justify the sinner is what angels desire to look into. And they are presented as their faces looking reverently down towards the throne and their angels wings touch one another. And Jesus, the Shekinah glory shines from between them. This is God. But Paul says there will be a substitute who would seek to sit in the place of God. It says that this power would, let me go back. This power, brothers and sisters, is none other than, let's, let's look at some identifying marks. Let's look at some identifying marks first. All right, so we have this here, we speak great words. He would wear out the saints. He would make war with the saints. All right. Now, brothers and sisters, when we look here, this is the Vatican. This is the Vatican City. This is the house of the hierarchical system of the papacy. Now, brothers and sisters, I've gone to this place. I've been in that building in the center there, and that formation of that wheel in the middle it is a symbol. It looks like, in one sense, it is a key. But in another sense, it represents two arms. It represents two arms in enclosing the earth. That's what it represents. So from the church is extended these long columns which are symbols of arms, and that disc in the middle is a symbol of the world, and the church encompasses the entire world. And for what purpose? For the glory of the Holy Roman Church. This is what it symbolizes. That disc in the middle, not only does it symbolize the earth, but it also symbolizes the sun, the S-U-N, which it worships as its central deity. Now, brothers and sisters, let's move on. Remember, we said blasphemy, a man who claims to forgive sin. Blasphemy also we found is a man who claims to forgive who be God. But notice, forgive sins. What do we see? We see this is Pope Francis at the confessional. When you go into St. Peter's Basilica, there are confessionals all around the, the, the foyer area of the basilica. And there you find confessionals in different languages for people to come and make their confession to the priest. This is who Pope, he's making a confession because they believe that they have the authority to forgive sin. Here is Pope Francis again, and as all the other popes have done, what is he sitting upon? A white throne. What do we see flanked to his left and to his right? Angels cherubims, as it were. He sits 
as God on earth to the people. Brothers and sisters, it says in John Paul's autobiography, in his autobiography calling Crossing the Threshold of Hope, <clears throat> it says all Roman Catholics must receive the Pope as God's vicar, as God's representative in the place as the, it says they must receive him as the vicar of Christ, as the second person of the Godhead. The Pope sits and is received as the second person of the Godhead. He is God's representative on earth. And thus he believes that he has the authority and the ability to, con to, to, to give this authority to his priest, to his bishops, to his cardinals, just as Jesus gave the Holy Spirit and gave power to his disciples. He gives power to his sons and daughters of God. So this power believes it has the authority to give power to its followers upon the earth. Notice, notice, notice your screen. Notice what this says. Pope says priests can forgive what? Grave sin of abortion. New cardinals receive red hats. That's all spiritualism and it all has a very demonic uh, uh, connotation. But notice what it says. At the Vatican, the picture I just showed you of the Vatican City, Pope Francis brought his special year of mercy to a close, but said the Catholic Church must continue to focus on the poor and doing acts of kindness. He said he was, watch this, he said he was extending mercy by formally giving all priests the authority to grant forgiveness to women who have committed, who have had an abortion. Previously, only bishops could absolve what the church calls grave sins. Uh, grave sins of abortion. Last week in Pope, uh, last week in Francis, elevated, also elevated 17 new cardinals from six continents, including three Americans. During the ceremony, he cautioned those, cautioned against those who raise walls, build barriers, and label people. So here we find, brothers and sisters, the Pope. What does Pope mean? It means Papa. What is Papa? Father. Holy Father. The Pope sits as God on the earth. When Pope Francis, when, 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 when uh, 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 John Paul was leaving and was leaving America before he died, and as he was going up in his plane, one of the commentators says, we now know what it means to pray our Father which art in heaven as the Pope took his flight. They said, now we know what it means to pray our Father who art in heaven. Everything that we would give homage to Christ and everything that we would worship him. The Bible says in Revelation 4, 4 verse 11, that God is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our honor for he is the creator. But everything that we would give God has now been taught to give to man. This is blasphemy, brothers and sisters. But the Bible tells us, go back to Revelation 13. Go back to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And this, afternoon, this evening, we will pick this up because there is another aspect to this power. There is another aspect to this power. It says in Revelation 13 that this power would receive a deadly wound. Notice what it says in verse 3. And I saw, and I saw one of his heads as it were what? Wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. Now go over, stay in chapter 13, and notice what the Bible says, <clears throat> beginning in verse 5 one more time. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. In other words, this power would begin its reign in 538 
in the early part of the sixth, in the, in the, in the middle part of the sixth century, as this power gained supremacy. Remember, it was in 508 that cut that King Clovis converted to Catholicism and began to move all of the Aryan powers in that region to worship the Holy Roman Empire, the bishops of Rome. And so what happens is in 538, she ascends to her authority. Because remember, the Bible says she was given her seat and great authority there in Rome. This is where King Clovis exalted her. And so for 40 and two months, 1260 years from 538 would bring us down to 1798, which the Bible says she would be led into captivity. Look here one more time. The Bible says <clears throat> she would prevail. She would make war with the saints. She would overcome them. Then it says in verse 10, verse 9, it says, If any man hath the need to hear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Notice your screen. This power received the deadly wound in 1798. In 1798, upon his refusal to renounce his temporal power, Pope Pius was taken prisoner and transported to France. Isn't it interesting that it was France that brought her to power and it was France that took away her power. Napoleon <clears throat> sent his general Berthier to capture the Pope at the Vatican and bring him back captive to France. So in 1798, upon his refusal to renounce his temporal power, you there, Tim? Pope Pius was taken prisoner and transported to France. He died one year later in Valence. In other words, so the Bible says, he that leadeth in the captivity would go into captivity. And this is what we see with this little horn power. But though she would receive a deadly wound, the Bible says her deadly wound would be healed. And once again, the world would wander after this beast. Brothers and sisters, as we come back this afternoon, this evening, we're going to see that this deadly wound is being healed. We're seeing that the world now is wandering after this beast. But God and his great mercy are holding the winds until his people are settled into the truth that they cannot be moved. And once God sees that his people are settled, he will allow the winds to blow. Brothers and sisters, will we, will we be ready to stand? Are we still allowing our minds to be shaken by letters, by books, by preaching, by a false spirit? Are we being shaken from the foundations of truth or are we standing upon a rock? Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for thy word. We thank you for thy truth. Lord, help us. Help us to understand. Help us to see how to stand. Help us, Lord, to realize the truth for this time and the position we ought to be in. Lord, we pray that you would guide us and you to direct our steps. We pray that you would keep us, Lord, that we would not be shaken in our minds, but established upon the truth. Lord, guide us, keep us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.